The title of my sermon this morning is Faithful Stewardship, and the kind of subtitle is Treasures. I'm going to tell you about this guy named R.G. Letourneau. I don't know if you ever heard of this dude. He's a very interesting guy. You know, so over the past couple weeks, I'm trying to come up with illustrations or examples of Christian individuals who have truly blessed people through their giving and, and done amazing things through their giving. And this is one guy that has. Letourneau is probably best known as an inventor, businessman, and entrepreneur who dropped out of school at the age of six, but went on to become one of the leading earth-moving machinery manufacturers of his day with plants on four continents and more than 300 patents to his name, meaning he had he invented 300 things that the government decided were his and they were patented to him. He also made major contributions to road construction and heavy equipment that favored that forever changed the world. I mean, he had a dramatic effect on World War II as well with some of the um, stuff he invented. But to me, what stands out the most about R.G. Letourneau was his contribution to the spread of the gospel of Christ throughout the world. Today I'm going to talk to you about giving and tithing, which is essentially giving 10% of your income. Letourneau believed in giving to God, but chose to take this commitment to a, a, a level that is, I would say, unseen of today. How about that? Letourneau decided that he wanted to live his life by keeping 10% of his income and giving 90% of his income to God. I mean, isn't that kind of crazy? So he, he lived on 10% of what he made and gave the other 90% to his church and to other Christian um, in, in God-centered um, things. I mean, it, wouldn't it be amazing? It would be an amazing thing to do. And of course, part of me wanted to say, well, I guess if you made a million dollars a year, it would be kind of easy to live on $100,000 a year. It's still more than I had, right? At the same time, it is still a commitment and it's still trust. I mean, and that, that's really the best way to do it. I mean, can you really imagine living... Or imagine giving 90% of all of your income every year to God and only living on 10%. And it's kind of hard for most of us to do so. It would be hard, but as this man's life story tells us, it is possible. It is very possible and feasible to do. One may ask what it takes to be able to do something like this, and for that matter, what it takes to just give 10%. And what I say is it takes faith and trust in God. You need to trust that God's going to provide for you. Jesus tells us that if we trust in Him, we will have enough faith to move mountains. And I would say that that's what this R.G. Letourneau did. He moved mountains with his faith. He trusted God. He knew what was going on. A woman named Corrie Ten Boom, who was a, du a Dutch Christian during World War II and the Holocaust, and is credited with saving countless lives of Jewish individuals in protecting them, says this. She said, I have, I have, ha okay, I have had many things in my hands. And I have lost them all. But whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. What we give to God is something that's going to forever be there. When in the end of it, anything I have, any, all of my possessions are just temporary. They're going to go away. We have a faithful Heavenly Father whom we can trust. He gave us 100% of everything that we own and possess. And 100%. Right down to our time, talents, and treasures. That's been my theme for the last two weeks or three weeks. When we come to this realization, giving back 90%, if maybe not as practical for some of us, is very feasible in our minds. You know what I'm getting at? Like, as in, it might not make sense. We might not, because of the amount of money we make, be able to give 90% to God. But, with faith and trust in God, that becomes a possibility and it's something we can consider. And I'm not preaching that today, don't get me wrong. I'm, as much as I love it, if everyone gave 90%, I don't think it's possible for all of us to give 90%. But what I'm saying is the faith and the trust that R.G. Letourneau had could be something that we have as well in whatever monetary amount God has led us to give, which is what I'm going to get at today. And in the end of it, really, I think a better place to start is at that 10% mark, that tithe. So this morning, I want to finish up our three-week study on Christian stewardship by focusing on the last of the three T's. Remember, we had time, talents, and now we have treasures. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at that. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for this opportunity that you've given us to study your word and to just truly examine what the scriptures say about giving to you, Lord, and about being good stewards of all that you've given us, Lord. I ask now that you inspire me, Lord, and lead me and, and draw me towards what you want me to proclaim today, Lord. Don't let me say stuff you don't want me to say. Allow me to stay focused on you. Allow me to proclaim your word and interpret the word of God in a way that's appropriate and accurate. Lord, I ask that every one of us, including myself, partake in your word today and just uh, enjoy and embrace what the message is today and the information that you're giving us through your word in your wonderful name. Amen. So over the past three weeks, like I said, I've talked to you about giving back to God and how God has given us 100% of everything we own. 
I mean, that, that's really where it all comes back to. God has given you everything you own and possess, including your time, talents, and treasures. God asks us to give or dedicate, no, not give, to dedicate everything about us to Him. He asks us to give in, or to dedicate everything about us to Him. This means that dedicating every moment of our lives, every skill that we possess, and every penny that we have ever owned to the glory of God. We need to use every... And we need to use everything we own and possess for His glory. But we do not have to, nor do I think it's possible, for us to give 100% of everything we have to God. And now understand what I'm saying here. The Bible says give all to the glory of God or do all for the glory of God. If I tried to give everything, every moment of my day, every talent I possess, and every penny I ever own, I would have a very hard time doing so. Because that means giving all of your time to God. Now, this is kind of the way I think of this. This means that you would have no entertainment time. Can't sit down and watch TV because that's not giving all of your time to God. Can't watch football this afternoon. It just doesn't work if you're trying to give 100% of your time to God. No private time because you're giving 100% of your time to God. No time for employment. You can't even work because working is still kind of for you, not for God. And then finally, not even bathroom breaks is really what I'm getting at here. Really, my point is that you can't give everything to God from a perspective of literally giving it to Him. The difference between dedicating all to the glory of God versus giving all to the glory of God. You get the difference. That's, I wanted to emphasize this because I don't think I've emphasized this as well the past couple of weeks. We dedicate our lives to God. We just don't necessarily have to give everything to God. It's not possible to give everything to God. I mean, honestly, in the end of it, there's no way I can give 100% of my time to God where I'm always serving Him. I mean, even as a pastor, I'm not doing this. I mean, I've dedicated my life, but there are still times I go and take time for myself. The difference, though, is that time that I'm taking for myself is still glorifying God. You get that's the difference here. The idea of glory, giving all the glory, of giving all to the glory of God versus giving everything you own to God. It's not possible. Even Jesus rested. He took time for himself. He wasn't always ministering. He took time for himself as well. So with this in mind, God does call us to give back to him in service of him, meaning our time and talents, which is what I focused on last week, as well as giving back to him of our money and possessions, which is really what I'm focusing on this week, our treasures. So this morning, I want to focus on giving financially or tithing. In doing this, I'm going to ask and answer two questions, very to the point, what does the Old Testament say about tithing? What does the New Testament say about tithing? So let's go ahead and take a look at what the Old Testament says about tithing. What does the Old Testament say about tithing? Let me start off with this little illustration, this little funny little joke thing here. The pastor stood before the congregation and said, I have bad news, I have good news, and I have more bad news. The congregation got quiet. The bad news is the church needs a new roof. The congregation groaned. The good news is we have enough money for the new roof. A sigh of relief was heard rippling through the group of the gathered group. The bad news is it's still in your pockets. So. <laughs> And you can only imagine what the reaction was. So what does the Old Testament say about tithing? If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to me to Leviticus chapter 27. If you don't have a Bible, look under your seat. And you'll find one there or in the seat in front of you or wherever they're at. Leviticus chapter 27. We're going to start at verse 30. And I'm going to read verse 30 down to verse 34. And then we're going to take a look at numbers before I really say too much more. Which of course for me is difficult. But... Leviticus chapter 27. Did I say 27 or 24? <laughs> Leviticus chapter 27. 27. Oh, yeah, good. We're on the same page. Then 27, verse 30, down to verse 34. So Moses, the author of these first five books of the Bible, the Torah, or the law, says this. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whomever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of, to, of, it, of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make a substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and the substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands the, the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. Now turn me to Numbers. Um, Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. The very next book. 
chapter 18, starting at verse 25. Numbers chapter 18, verse 25, down to verse 29. So once again, Moses writes, really, Moses writes what the Lord says, as we see here. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Levites, and say to them, when you, when you receive from the Israelites the tithe I gave you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. <coughs> Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. In this way, you also will present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. From these tithes, you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron the priest. You must present as the Lord's portion the best and holiest part of everything given to you. So I'm not going to get into too much detail. If I tried to give the context of these verses, we'd be here all day. Because, I mean, trying to understand the, the sacrificial, some different things, whatever, the, the, the sacrifices they made. We, need to do, we do need to remember that this information was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. This is right after Egypt kind of thing. They don't have a homeland yet. They're wandering in the wilderness. And they're called to give a tithe, which a tithe is literally a tenth, one tenth. An interesting side thought is this. The Old Testament law, and you kind of heard it here, actually requires multiple tithes. One, one for the Levites, as we saw in Numbers, one for the use of the temple and the feasts, and one for the poor of the land, which would have pushed the total to around 23.3% of their income. So you shouldn't complain about 10% is really my thought. So to some level or another, I think it is important to point this out, though. This is something I wanted to point out, and again, I'm trying to be all right up to the front of this here. There was no separation of church and state. So nowadays, you, know, you give your tithe to the church, you give your taxes to the government. There was, this wasn't the case back then. The Israelites' religion was their government. So they all, it all connected together. It is at least before they became an independent nation. So they're all connected together. So the tithe they were given was also essentially a tax. So with that in mind, I, I don't know. We'll get into that a little bit more later. And I mean... I'm, my point is I'm probably not expecting 23%. I don't think we need to give 23% as we're going to hear. We're not going to have to give 10% as you're going to find out. The question I had though is why? Why did God ask the people of Israel to tithe? I mean, we obviously see the benefit to the country of Israel, and to the religion, to the temple, to the Levites. But what benefit was it for the people of Israel to tithe and to give back to God? And let's take a look, if I can flip my page. Take a look at Malachi. If you can turn to Malachi now. So we're leaving the first five books. Go to the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. And we're going to see what, exact the, uh, what exactly the benefit was to the people of Israel. And why were they called to tithe? What benefit was it to them to give back to God? So Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 down to verse 12 with a very special emphasis on verse 10. And uh, my Bible has a heading of robbing God. So Malachi chapter 3, starting at verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. And I wanted to point something out real quick. If you understand what this is saying. I mean, the descendants of Jacob have, have not been very good followers of God. You know, they went around, they, they make multiple mistakes. I mean, you figure up to this point, I mean... If you can understand, okay, so they left Egypt, and all these amazing plagues took place. And then God separates the water. And they walk, Moses, they, they walk right through the, 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 the water. They're safe. And then the, the army that was chasing them is gone. They're freed. And yet what was one of the first things they did when Moses got back? He went up to Mount Sinai, he came back, and they made a golden calf. They, they worshipped a cow. And this just shows you the, the complete lack of any, I don't know, whatever you want to call it for the Israelite people. And my point here is God does not change because if God changed, he would have destroyed them. But because God does not change, as he said, O descendants of Jacob, you are, are not destroyed. You are not destroyed. Now look at verse 7. I mean, God is a loving God. He doesn't destroy us when we make mistakes. Thank God. Verse 7. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees, and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. 
But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Then verse 9, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. God is saying if they just trust and obey Him, they're going to be so overwhelmed with blessings that it's just going to be too much for them. Remember, I think last week I used the illustration of the father. The, <coughs> the dad wanted to take a french fry. The kid slapped his hand away. He, you know, The kid got upset. So the father's like, I gave him all of this stuff. And the father was like, I could give him, I can take all his french fries away or I can overwhelm him with french fries. I mean, God can pour down blessings where we're just flooded in blessings, which is too much. And that's what it says. He can open the floodgates of heaven to pour blessings upon us or upon them. Verse 11, I will prevent pests from destroying your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. They're blessed if they trust in Him through giving, as we are. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. The, the bottom line is we will be blessed. The Israelites are blessed, and we will be blessed if we get back to Him. So in the Old Testament, this is the, essentially the... The summarization of what the Old Testament says, the Old Testament says to tithe, to give 10%. But, what does the New Testament give or say? The New Testament, let me start off with this little funny joke as well. Two men were marooned on an island. One man um, paced back and forth, worried and scared, while the other man sat back and was sunning himself. The first man said to the second man, aren't you afraid we are about to die? No, said the second man. I make $100,000 a week and tithe faithfully to my church every week. My pastor will find me. No. So the New Testament, here we go, ready? The New Testament says absolutely nothing about tithing. Uh, let, me, let me actually reiterate this. The New Testament does not command nor even recommend that followers of Jesus should tithe, but the concept of giving is very clear. And the idea of giving back our finances to God is made quite clear clear to us. So let's take a look at a couple passages. First of all, Luke chapter 6 verse 38, Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. God is going to take care of us. That's the common theme here. I don't know if you're catching on to that. The Israelites were blessed because they were faithful in giving, and we are blessed because we are faithful in giving. So the best example in the New Testament of giving back to God was the collection for the saints. Let me kind of give you a context here. The church in Jerusalem was the, the, the center point. It's where, where Christianity began. But it's also where, the, where Judaism was located. And the, the Jewish people were, like the religious leaders, were not very happy with this new religion. And as a result, they persecuted the church immensely in Jerusalem. They persecuted, and then a word I like to use, they oppressed them. To be oppressed means to be not allowed to buy or sell, essentially. The, the Christian, the Jewish Christians, because of their faith, were not allowed to buy stuff. So, and, and no one would buy from them. So maybe you're, you own a bunch of sheep. You can't buy what you need to take care of the sheep, nor can you sell the sheep because no one wants to buy them from you because you're a Christian. I mean, it's what we might know more as persecution in our country today. They were so oppressed to the point, or oppressed to the point that they were essentially in a state of poverty. Paul recognized this, and he decided he wanted to take up a collection for them from the Gentile churches, which is really an amazing thought when you think about where Christianity came from. So the best example of giving in the New Testament was the collection for the impoverished saints in Jerusalem led by Paul. We're going to look at two passages of Scripture. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So turn to me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 down to verse 8. Let's go ahead and read this, and uh, just follow along with me as I read this here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 down to verse 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So I broke this down. This is a sermon within a sermon, unfortunately, for you guys. It's not, not, I'm not getting too much into it, but I, I came up with three points that I can pull out of this. Three essential things that I think this section of Scripture can teach us about giving. For, first of all, God wants us to give generously. God wants us to give generously. Look at verse 8. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. The New American Standard actually translates this, um, this word generously as bountifully. And I found this very interesting. In Greek, the Greek word literally has a tie to blessings. So those who bless will be blessed. So if you bless others, God's going to bless you. Once again, tying back to that blessings. The one who gives out blessings will receive blessings in return. Christians are called to be generous with our money. Since, as we've already emphasized several times, it's not, you know, it is not yours anyway, it's God's. God gave you everything you own. So you should be generous with what God has given you. The second little sub-point here. God wants us to give cheerfully. Look at verse 7 of, uh, of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think it's important to recognize this, and I, I kind of hinted at this during the offering. God doesn't need your money. He gave you everything you want. You know, God's given you everything. God doesn't need your money to survive. And, and, and this is kind of to the point. It doesn't matter. You don't have to put anything in the offering plate. Because guess what? God's still going to do what he has to do. God doesn't need our money to, to have his kingdom get advanced. What God is doing in allowing us to get back to him is the same thing what God is doing when he wants us to go tell people about him. He doesn't need us to preach his word. The whole universe declares the glory of God. He doesn't need me to do it. I mean, I get out at night and I look up at the stars and I'm like, wow. I mean, who am I to this? God doesn't need me. God doesn't need my money. But God allows us. He's given us the opportunity, the blessing to be involved in this. Both in telling the world about Christ as well as giving back to him. He's, he's offered us that opportunity. What an amazing blessing that is. The Greek word used here for cheerful comes from the word or the noun heleros and means cheerful or joyous. The noun heleros is actually being used as an adjective. An adjective, of course, is a word that it describes a noun. So the noun here is giver, and the adjective being used to describe this giver is cheerful. If looking at verse 8 again, you see that the opposite of cheerful in this, in this instance is uh, um, reluctant. God wants a cheerful giver, not a reluctant giver. If you're reluctant about giving, you need to talk to God. God needs, he doesn't want your money. He doesn't need your money. He's given you the opportunity. It's worship. We worship God when we give back to him. We don't worship God when we do so because of, a, because of an obligation or reluctancy. So now this last one. So we have, you know, God wants us to give generously. God wants us to give cheerfully. And then finally, as a result of our giving, God will bless us. Once again, do you see the common theme here? Giving equals blessings. We've been blessed. Look at verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Or verse 8 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Or chapter 9. I'm losing it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 once again. And God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things at all times. Having all that you need. You will abound in every good work. I thought so he's going to bless you abundantly. Abundantly is a nice sounding word. I mean, abundant. I mean, that means everything you're ever going to need. God's going to bless you with everything you're ever going to need. But here's, I kind of thought this was interesting. You know, God is able to bless you abundantly. And then the last part of that verse, you will abound in every good work. Because of the blessings God has poured upon you, you are going to go and serve him. The blessings that we get. I mean, it's just this constant, this constant cycle of blessings by God and giving back to God through our works as well as our money. Let me read you this, though. So, I think that if you asked any Christian who truly gave to God from a cheerful perspective, you would have a hard time finding this Christian not feeling very blessed. 
in this Christian not being very cheerful about their giving. And here's a great example. John D. Rockefeller is an example of the benefits of giving. He achieved what our culture calls success. Rockefeller had amassed more wealth than he could have ever spent. By the time Rockefeller was 53 years old, his life was a wreck. Throughout his business career, he said, I never placed my head upon the pillow at night without reminding myself that my success, my success might only be temporary. He was the richest man in the world, and yet he was miserable in every sense of the word. He was sick physically, mentally, and emotionally. There was no humor, balance, or joy in his life. Then a transformation occurred. He determined to become a giver rather than an accumulator. He became or he began to give his millions away. He founded the Rockefeller Foundation dedicated to fighting disease and ignorance around the world. He lived to be 98 years old and was a happy man in those years because of his new and revitalized definition of success. What is success? Isn't that true? I mean, success is not the amount of money you make. It's what you do with that money, really, is, is probably the best way to des describe this. So we need to be generous, cheerful, and then accept the blessings. If we give to God cheerfully out of praise and worship to Him, then we have no need to fear the future because we trust that He will give back to us. If we give to God, if we trust Him, He's going to take care of us. So that's it. Giving equals blessings. That's really where this comes back to. Now let's turn to another passage of Scripture as we kind of head towards my, my ending here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So just kind of go a couple pages to your left. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. So the Apostle Paul once again writes to the church in Corinth regarding the collection for the saints. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and verse 2. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. And this is what he told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So let's tear this apart a little bit. So the New Testament does not say give 10% of your income back to God. But, thankfully, it does say this. Paul said a sum of money in keeping with your income. Would me, to me, what that says is a percentage. A portion. And I, I say thank God because imagine if God told every one of us to give $5,000 a month to God. Some of us might be able to give that much. I don't know if I could. It's a lot of money. $5,000 a month to God, if God said a monetary amount of money that we're supposed to give to Him, we'd have a problem. I mean, a lot of us wouldn't be able to give to it, give it. And then there's probably some people that think that's not enough to give. But that's not what God said. He said, give a sum of money in keeping with your income. Meaning, look at how much money you make and decide how much you think God wants you to give. The percentage that God wants you to give. I mean, God wants you to give the money that you have, not the money you don't have. I mean, God doesn't want you to swipe your credit card and pay it off later. I mean, that's not how it works. I mean, you can't give more than you own. God gets that. He, again, giving is a way we worship Him. There's no real, like, I don't know how you say, God doesn't really benefit from the giving. I mean, God's God. He doesn't need our money. What, what, who benefits is us. When we give back to Him, we benefit from that giving. We benefit and we are blessed from what we give to Him. And really, what, this is kind of what I'm hearing here, too. What this is also saying is that none of us have an excuse. And this is tough, because, you know, I, don't, I, I hate to put everyone in a spot. We don't have an excuse not to give. And this is why. Because it is according to our income. Since it's according to our income, we're going to give according to how much money we're making. You're not going to give how much money someone else is making. I mean, honestly, if we tried to give what John D. Rockefeller was making, we'd have a problem, because we don't have that much money to give. We give what we are able to give. We give what we are able to give according to our income. God is asking for a percentage of your income. Now, the question I have is what percentage of our income? I mean, that's really where this comes back to. The Old Testament said a tithe. Should 10% be the kind of the balancing part, the, the kind of where we're focusing on? And I, I want to say yes, and this is why. I mean, I think really what I'm saying is 10% is a pretty good spot to start. And this is why. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 down to verse 19 says this. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The Old Testament law, the law of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the first five books, has not been eliminated by Jesus. It's been fulfilled by Him. Not one of the Ten Commandments has been eliminated. And in reality, we are still called to obey those Ten Commandments. If anything, guess what? Jesus amplified the Ten Commandments. I mean, honestly, right? It's not just, you. okay, well, he said, don't murder, right? I mean, oh, we can't murder anyone. Well, that's easy to do. I've never murdered someone, so it kind of works out. But that's not what Jesus said. He doesn't even want us to hate somebody. You know what it means to hate somebody is to think it in your head. Oh, I don't like that person. That's essentially murdering them according to Christ. So you broke that commandment. The Bible says, or Jesus tells us, you know, the Old Testament says you're not supposed to commit adultery. Well, that's not that hard. I'll just avoid women that thought my wife were kind of good. But that's not what Jesus said. He says, I can't even think about it in my head. It's just as bad to think about it in your head. If you were to go through the list of the Ten Commandments today, I am 100% sure that you will find at least one and probably more that you have broken. And guess what? The penalty for breaking those commandments is death. That's it. You look at the Old Testament. Every, all but the last one, the greed one, the, the tenth commandment was not provable. The other nine commandments were provable. And if you got caught, caught doing it, the Old Testament law condemned you to death. Jesus, though, fulfilled the law. You were condemned by death. Or condemned to death because of your disobedience to the Old Testament law. But guess what? Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law by paying the penalty for our sins for the times that we have broken the law. And now how, the way I'm trying to tie this in is this. Since Jesus did nothing but amplify the Old Testament and pay the penalty for the, the, the sins that we commit by breaking the law of the Old Testament, I think 10% is a pretty good place to start. That's just kind of where I'm getting at here. I think that 10% of your income is a pretty good place to start considering God wants all of you as a sacrifice to Him. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore I urge you brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. God has given you 100% of everything you own. The least we can give is give Him 10% back. I mean, really, if you think of it, the least we can do is give Him 10% back. And then again, we need to remember the blessings. The blessings that He's poured upon us. Now, this might hurt. Don't get me wrong. Even 10% might be a lot to some of us. You might need to make some sacrifices to do it. And it might involve a lot of trust in God for provision. But you have a loving Heavenly Father who will provide for you. And isn't that, that's, that's really where it all comes back to. You need to trust that God will provide for you. Trust that God knows your heart and knows everything you need. So let me go ahead and close up now. This is from Picker, Pickerington, Ohio. A church, an, an Ohio church congregation ordered a pizza from Domino's during a service, then tipped the driver more than 100, no, 100, more than $1,000 that had been collected in a special offering. The driver brought the pizza, the $5.99 pizza, to Sycamore Creek Church in Pickerton in suburban Columbus on October 4th. The Reverend Steve Markle brought her on stage and asked her the biggest tip she'd ever received, and she said about $10. That's when Marco told her the teaching at the church had been about generosity, so that the congregation so the congregation had taken up an offering for the driver. And of course, she broke down in tears, as you can imagine. And this is this is where I'm coming with this. This is how I want to end things. The point I'm making is not that we should call Buffalo Chips right now and order a pizza and take up an offering for them. That's not what I'm really getting at. As though that that would be cool, though. And this is why, though. The point I want to make is that the number one reason we give back to God is to tell other people about Christ. Think of the blessings that this woman went through upon coming to the church. She works as a pizza delivery person. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know where that ranks on the list of jobs, but I mean, if we looked at New Testament stuff, probably around Shepherd somewhere. Not the most enjoyable job. Dealing with people who don't really care for what you're doing. I mean, they, the person drove a pizza to your house. And what a huge blessing. 
I mean, what a great way that we can show the love of Christ, that this church showed the love of Christ to them. I mean, imagine the love that that pizza delivery girl felt from the group of Christians. And I, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Maybe she went to church. And isn't that the goal, right? Imagine if this one action led her to Jesus. And wouldn't a thousand dollars be worth that? And I, I think it would. Christians need to put Christ on display through the words and actions. And one way that we put Christ on display through our words and actions is by giving to Him. Now I'm going to flip that. Christians are able to put Christ on display at their local church and other Christian establishments through their words and actions as a result of generous giving. When we give to God, we're able to tell others about Him. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 down to verse 38 say this, says this, or Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then verse 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Your giving to God supports this church as well as the ministry that we do. But it goes so far beyond that. That's, this is really one, what, I, what I want to emphasize. We, uh, last week at um, Dan Hanna's church, Chester Baptist Church, they prayed for a guy named... Um, oh, the people over here. Oh, they're from our community. Donald. Donald and Martha Hart. And they're serving God in Turkey. They're missionaries in Turkey. Your giving helps them tell people about Jesus in Turkey. Your giving helps people throughout the world know about Christ and bring people closer to Christ. That's why we give. It's for no other reason than that. Because in the end of it, if there wasn't... if the Okay, in the end of it, if we didn't tell others about Jesus, there'd be no reason to give. This would just be a country club. The reason we meet here every week, the reason we get back to God is so we can have the opportunity to express the love of Christ to them through our words and actions by telling them about the love that Jesus gave. And of course, that love is amplified and, and exemplified through Jesus dying on the cross to forgive us of our sins and then rising from the grave so that we can go to heaven when we die. So I want to just praise God now and I ask that if that's what you need to do, if you, if you are at that point in your life where you're ready to turn to Him, turn to Him today. And then the other element of it is if you're willing to make that jump into giving back to God. I, I just... I, I don't know, it's hard for me to explain, but like Tabitha and I have been blessed tremendously by giving to him. We just trust him and we do it. And that's what happens. That's the, everyone here with the, um, John D. Rockefeller and then that R.G. Laterno, they just trusted God. There was nothing else. So trust God today. Trust God with your time, your talents, and your treasures, and he will take care of you. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you. I ask that you just pour down your blessings upon us now. Lord, I can't acknowledge how, how amazing you are in that you... That you want us to be a part of your ministry. I mean, that, that's really, for me, the, the biggest part of all of this, Lord. You don't need us. You don't need us to tell people about you. You don't need us to raise money or to, to, to collect money for your kingdom, Lord. You could do it all on your own. But because of your love for us, you've chosen to allow us to be a part of this, Lord. And if we really took a moment to think about that, think about that amazing blessing that that is. God, you love us so much, and you want us to be part of your kingdom. Lord, help us realize this when we give back to you. Help us realize this when we tell people about you. Help us realize this when we use our skills to just glorify you. So, Lord, now as we close, I just ask that if, you're, if it is your will, Lord, allow this group of people to truly turn to you and put their trust in you, Lord, in everything they do, including their giving. But most importantly, Lord, that every one of us tells others about you. So, Father, I thank you and I praise you now in your wonderful, wonderful name. Amen.